Glenn Van Zutphen on Saturday mornings with Neil Humphreys, only on Money FM 89.3. Welcome back to Saturday mornings here on Money FM 89.3. Uh, the coalition to end Uyghur forced labor has uh, been trying to engage with the uh, International Olympic Committee to find out if there is any forced labor being used uh, to uh, create, to make any of the Olympic merchandise that is going to be used uh, for the uh, 2022 game starting in February. Uh, joining us now to talk more about this topic, Bennett Freeman, the chair of EG Justice, vice president of the Responsible Sourcing Network, who is at the heart of uh, the End Uyghur Forced Labor Campaign, Coalition to End Forced Labor. Uh, Bennett, good morning. Uh, welcome uh, from the West Coast of the United States. Thank you. Great to be with you, Glenn, together with Neil and your audience in Singapore. Well, we're, we're so uh, happy to have you with us. Uh, set the stage for us, uh, William Bennett, uh, in terms of, uh, first of all, how you got involved in, in this issue and, and what the issues actually are. Sure. Well, I've been um, involved in international labor and human rights for over two decades, um, ever since I was the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. So my work over the years, um, ever since being in government, is focused on advocacy for labor and human rights all around the world, and I've been especially involved in forced labor uh, in recent years. And it's very well known that there is a huge, massive problem of forced labor of the Uyghur Muslim ethnic minority authority in the Qingzhan region of western China. It's been very well documented and in fact there are estimates that up to one-fifth of cotton products sold around the world uh, may contain forced labor of Uyghur people. Um, and the Uyghurs, as many people re understand, have been subject to um, other human rights abuses, not just forced labor, but massive incarceration and um, a huge surveillance and most horrifically forced sterilization of, of women. So it's a terrible situation and I've been very involved with the um, coalition to end Uyghur forced labor which brings together labor and human rights advocates and trade unions around the world to really press companies, governments and international institutions to take action. And it's clear as can be as we're approaching the Beijing Olympics starting just three weeks from today, um, that uh, the International Olympic Committee together with the government of China has a real responsibility to show the world that the Olympics will not be a showcase for forced labor. We hope they'll just be a showcase for athletic competition, but we're, we fear that they'll be a showcase for labor and human rights abuses. Well, Benny, that ties in nicely with my question. I mean, Glenn sent out a, a, a letter this week, didn't you, to IOC? I, I did. I, I reached out to the um, to the IOC, asking them to uh, comment on um, the story uh, about potential forced labor being used to make Olympic products. Uh, I sent it out to uh, three or four different uh, sources at the IOC. Um, I have not heard any response from them. Mm. And indeed, uh, uh, Bennett, I believe there, there have been no responses to your organization as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, uh, on behalf of the coalition, I spent eight months um, patiently, persistently trying to engage the IOC. Um, I'm a in, in a very quiet I, way, behind the quiet, scenes way, right? Quiet, mm -hmm. behind the scenes way. I'm a diplomat who believes in dialogue and negotiation, not confrontation, um, uh, to the extent absolutely possible. And I uh, actually had, um, you know, some reasonable discussions over those many months. But then, at the very highest levels of the IOC, there was a decision made to um, only engage with our coalition on the most severe, restrictive terms. They said that they would talk with us in a what they called an active listening session. Well, we believe in two-way dialogue, and we wanted to share information and analysis with them, but also hear from them what steps they have taken to mm -hmm. do what we call due diligence uh, to see what forced labor there could possibly be in Olympic-branded merchandise. And they were unwilling to conduct that kind of what we hoped for would be a substantive, constructive, mutually respectful two-way dialogue. Yeah. What research or evidence have you uh, found with regards to 
Olympic branded merchandise, you know, Beijing Olympic branded merchandise that was possibly made in these in these forced labor camps? Well, there's one. Um, I, I hate to use this phrase, but there's one clear smoking gun that's already out there, and that's ANTA, which is essentially China's equivalent of, of Nike, um, mm. which is the official sportswear uh, uniform supplier to um, the, the Beijing Olympics, and uh, they have um, blatantly, explicitly said um, last spring of 2021 that they use, they source cotton from Xinjiang, and they will continue to do so. Uh, and they're a huge sourcer right there. Uh, that's really the clearest evidence, and, and that is uh, has been widely publicized in the international media, most recently in a story published by the Wall Street Journal just last week. So the evidence is there uh, of abuses, human rights abuses with the Uyghur people, the Muslim minorities. What are you hoping for now, Bennett? What are you hoping to see from IOC? What kind of response are you hoping for? Before we get to the general public and corporate yeah. response, what are you hoping to see from the IOC? At this point, um, we're not expecting any more from the IOC. We had hoped to have engaged in that kind of a two-way dialogue to exchange information. And what we really wanted to see was what due diligence they may have undertaken and, and to have then encourage them to take any necessary steps to remove any merchandise that could be made with, a, with weaker forced labor. I think it's too late for that. The games are starting in less than three weeks. So at this point, I have to say that um, what we, uh, I think we're going to see is um, disgust, outrage uh, at the International Olympic Committee for not coming clean to the world about their responsibility. Uh, and I hope uh, that that may lead to uh, a reform of the IOC, uh, which is really behind the curve. You know, there's been a growing set of standards and expectations around the world the last two decades that governments, international institutions, multinational corporations and their suppliers come clean on labor and human rights, that they undertake due diligence, that they disclose that, that they engage in dialogue. Uh, and the IOC is pledged to do all that, but beginning in 2024 and beyond, that's not good enough. We needed that now. We needed that in recent months, recent weeks. It's too late for the Beijing Olympics, but this is going to be a source, I think, of outrage around the world. We're talking with Bennett Freeman, chair of EG Justice, vice chair of Responsible Sourcing Network, uh, around uh, the allegations that uh, forced labor, forced Uyghur labor has been used or is being used uh, in some ways to produce Olympic branded goods for the Beijing Olympics. We have reached out to the IOC for comment to see what they have done to try to understand uh, what this potential problem is, and we have not received any response from them, unfortunately. So we continue on with Bennett, who has been working with the Coalition to End Uyghur Forced Labor. Uh, Bennett, this idea of the Olympic Organizing Committee not looking too deeply into what's happening in a country where the games are being held is nothing new. I, I can remember going back to uh, 1994. I, I uh, worked at the uh, Los Angeles Olympics. Uh, sorry, 1984. Excuse me. And at that time, you know, the uh, the Los Angeles city government was was being criticized for pushing homeless people out further out uh, to get away, get them away from Los Angeles, so that the guests in for the Olympics at UCLA Village and elsewhere wouldn't see the homeless people. Uh, Again, the IOC didn't step in, didn't take a stand on it, and, and we've, I think it's safe to say we've seen this over the decades with uh, subsequent Olympic Games. So uh, given that sort of posture, they want to keep it all about the Games themselves, uh, A, are you surprised, um, and B, uh, does... You know, is it just because we are in a new ESG era uh, that the IOC even should be concerned about uh, these potential uh, abuses that might be happening not only for these games but for others. Look, I'm not surprised by the stance of the IOC. Nonetheless, the coalition felt that we had to give this the, a real try or, uh, to really try to engage them. And for God's sake, you would think that the IOC would engage with the coalition to end Uyghur forced labor 
about Uyghur forced labor. I mean, it would seem to be a pretty straightforward proposition. But you're right, there's been a, a whole history of uh, neglect um, of labor and human rights in connection with, with Olympics, summer and winter. But it also depends, it depends not just on the IOC itself and its disposition, uh, or for that matter, its corporate sponsors. It also depends very significantly, of course, on the host country government, the host city. Uh, and in this case, um, I think it's fair to observe that the IOC, like many corporations, multinational corporations around the world, including corporate sponsors of the IOC itself, uh, as well as many governments around the world, are very wary of challenging China. Uh, and we're at a time of uh, extraordinary geopolitical stress and, and, and competition with China and the West, not least with the United States. And I think the IOC's attitude, they'll have to speak for themselves if they're willing to, um, is to try to take the politics off the table. That's not the 21st century world. The 21st century world has to deal with labor rights, with human rights, with, with corporate responsibility. And the IOC as an institution itself can't simply separate itself from these issues. It ha itself has to demonstrate transparency and accountability, and that's what we want to see. Well, and, and the invitation is open anytime the IOC wants to come on the show and talk about this. We're happy to have them on uh, to, to further discuss, uh, like you say, a topic that you just can't be ignored in the 21st century. No, absolutely. Exactly. And, and, and Benny, this is the thing that concerns me. Organizations like yours do magnificent work. I mean, truly magnificent work. But I've covered Olympics over the years like Glenn. I've also covered World Cups. And it begins to feel like, you know, Groundhog Day. I remember before the Russian World Cup, there was talks of, right, there's going to be boycotts over accusations of authoritarianism. Same thing in the Brazil World Cup. You know, right-wing politics, uh, the sweeping away of the favelas and the local people. The, the, the Summer Olympics in China, there was talk of boycotts again. What I'm saying is we see this in the build-up to these tournaments, and we're seeing it right now with the Qatari World Cup. Similar thing, forced labor, mm. deaths, yep. building the stadiums, the World Cup stadiums. And my fear is, Bennett, once that World Cup starts, once the Beijing Olympics start, it'll all be about who's going to win the next gold medal, uh, the medal tallies, and it won't be forgotten, but it might be sidelined. What do you see happening at the Beijing Olympics? Do you think there will be more pushback this time? Yes, I do. I do. And I would contrast the Beijing Olympics with the so to Tokyo Summer Olympics that we just saw several months ago, where the story leading into Tokyo was COVID, and appropriately so. Mm. COVID was the story of the first couple of days uh, at Tokyo. And then, uh, wonderfully, I think, for the world, um, the, the focus shifted to world-class, spectacular athletic competition that the world needed in 2021 amidst this, this terrible pandemic. I don't think that's going to be the case um, in, in Beijing in a few weeks. Sure, there's going to be spectacular uh, athletic competition on the, the, the rinks and the slopes, but I think that the uh, discussion and, frankly, the criticism uh, around human rights is going to be part of the coverage um, and, and the legacy uh, of these games. And it's not going to fade away just the first few few days. And the pity of it is, is that the IOC actually has been advised the last several years by world-class experts to get its act together on human rights. Uh, and there have been various NGOs around the world, different bodies who've been pushing, not only the IOC, but FIFA, you know, the sponsor of the World Club, on labor and human rights. And indeed, there's a center for sports and human rights based in Geneva, Switzerland, whose entire mission is to raise standards around human rights in what we call these mega sporting events. So the IOC knows that the expectations are out there. They've had access to the expertise, and they've got a few good people inside working on it. The problem is at the top where they are, frankly, I, I hate to say it, but they are insular and arrogant and unwilling to open up in front of the world and we know part of the reason is is who the host of these games are and you know and that just uh, we can't uh, have this kind of situation in the world where uh, either major governments or internet institutions or for that matter corporations aren't accountable uh, and human rights should come first 
Yeah, I'm talking with Bennett Freeman, the chair of EG Justice, the vice chair of Responsible Sourcing Network, and the former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Bennett, this um, this is a really tough one for even uh, the highest levels of government to deal with, getting yeah. involved in human rights issues in another country. Yeah. Um, is, is the IOC, is the Olympics ever going to be able to uh, realistically make a change like this? And uh, what is the way forward from your perspective? I know you're not an IOC official, but, but you mentioned they have a department that kind of talks about these issues. Yeah. What would it take from your standpoint to end something that, you know, major corporations have and governments haven't been able to address in this case in Xinjiang? Well, I, I think that the IOC is going to have to, you know, really undertake some significant reforms. They, they know what human rights are about. They've actually got some policies and guidelines on the books. The problem is, is that they're not implementing them, or if they are, they're not talking about them. But I think that there's some leverage points here. You know, one is who the hosts of the future games are going to be, and I'm hopeful that France um, is the host of the 2024 Summer Olympics, mm -hmm. a country with a great tradition and history of commitment to human rights, um, is going to uh, stand up here and, and, and try to raise standards, and I hope that other Olympic hosts will in the future. But I think the corporate sponsors have a particular responsibility and an opportunity here um, to say to the IOC, look, you know, we're forking over a billion dollars or so um, for, to, to use this as the great global brand marketing platform, but there need to be some standards. We've got some principles at stake. We've got our reputations at stake. Uh, and you can't just be living in the in the 19th or 20th century here. So I'm hoping that however searing an experience this might be for the corporate sponsors in particular in the next five or six weeks, that they're going to uh, push uh, and it won't be a very visible or audible push, but I'm hoping that behind the scenes they're going to push. And I also hope that there'll be a new generation of leadership at the IOC and with pressure from the athletes, for God's sake. You know, athletes mm -hmm. are human beings and they're there first and foremost to compete and to win. But athletes have values, and we saw a lot of outpouring from athletes over concern over the, the, the situation with the, the Chinese woman tennis player Peng Shui just in recent weeks. Right. So there's yeah. some real, um, I think, uh, possibilities coming just from athletes uh, themselves, not just from human rights and labor rights groups. But not just athletes. On a personal, individual level, what can we do? Because sometimes you think when an issue is this big, this vast, you end up having almost this sense of helplessness. But I'm sure on an individual basis, Bennett, there are things that people can do. Are there websites they can go to, yeah. petitions, boycotts? Sure. What absolutely. would you recommend individuals doing here? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, first of all, go to the website of the organization that I'm involved with in these issues, the Coalition to End Uyghur Forced Labor, and which represents it's a coalition of 400 different organizations. I'm not even going to mention more than a few other than uh, the work Workers' Rights Consortium, Human Rights Watch, uh, but then the Uyghur groups themselves. I mean, take a look at their, people should look at their websites, which document um, the, the horrors visited on the Uyghur people in, in Western China, the World Uyghur Congress, Campaign for Uyghurs, and, and a number of others. But people can also, as consumers, can make choices about mm. uh, products that they buy, what they wear, what they drink. Uh, and, and, and so forth. And the list of Olympic sponsors is visible for all to see. And I think that there's a real opportunity for consumers to challenge some of these companies, whether in their, their buying uh, habits or as shareholders, um, and to support the activist groups that are really trying to hold not just the companies, but the institutions, now the IOC, uh, accountable. Absolutely. Oh, Bennett, thank you so much uh, for this conversation. Uh, uh, vitally important uh, for people on all sides of this issue, not the least of which are uh, the people potentially being forced into labor and, and unsound and unsafe practices. Uh, will you come back on in future months as there might be any updates on this story? And if the IOC does want to respond, uh, we'd, we'd love to have you back on. Thank you, guys. I'd be absolutely delighted and a pleasure talking with both of you, uh, Glenn and Neil, and your audience in Singapore this morning. Thank